to come and to worship together and to study God's Word together. I'm so glad that you guys have chosen to do that. And uh, it is a special day. I know a lot of people today are giving gifts of love to the loved ones in their life. And, you know, every time we come here, it's an opportunity to celebrate the ultimate love, and that's God himself. The Word of God tells us that he is indeed love. And the ultimate uh, demonstration of that was when Jesus laid down his life for us on the cross. So it's amazing to know how much God loves us. So we have an opportunity to just connect and to be in his presence and to just give our love back to him and praise and adoration and just to spend time with him and in his word. So we're glad you guys are here to do that. If you're visiting today, by the way, we consider it an honor and a privilege to have you guys with us. And whether this is your church home and you come to the 9 o'clock service, the 11 o'clock we just want each of you to know that truly our focus is on Jesus. It is all about him, as the word of God says. The volume of the book is written of him in the Psalms and the book of Hebrews. So that's why we say it's all about Jesus. And we're just confident that when we seek him, that he honors his word and he draws near to us. So we'll draw near to him this morning, just trusting him to meet us here. We're so glad, again, you guys are here. And if, uh, as a visitor, if you'd like somebody in our leadership team to connect with you on the offering box back there, we do have some welcome cards. You can fill one of those out. Or if you've been attending for a while, and haven't contributed that or given that information to us so that we can connect with you or you'd like us to connect, just please fill one of those out and I'll make sure that the, that the right parties get it. So again, we're thankful that you're here and uh, my wife's going to open in a word of prayer and we're going to begin our time of worship. Dear Lord God, we just humbly come before your throne of grace and God, we just thank you that we have this time to come together to spend time in worship to you, Lord. God, I pray that you would help us to just clear our thoughts and just clear our hearts, God, that they can be totally focused to you. Lord, help us to not be distracted by the things of this world or the trials we may be in, but help us to just take this time of worship to truly seek you, Lord, to keep our eyes and hearts focused on you and to just give you the worship and adoration that you deserve. Lord, it's just overwhelming to us that the God who created the universe, the God who spoke everything into creation at just the sound of his voice, God, that you are sitting there waiting for us to come into your presence and to spend time with you. Lord, it's never a lack of you wanting to be with us, but um, sometimes we find ourselves in places where we get ourselves distracted or um, we're just selfish with our time. But God, I just pray this morning as we sing these worship songs that they would be worship to you, Lord, that we wouldn't just be singing songs or standing in this building um, waiting for you to come to us, but that we would reach out our hands to worship to you, Lord, to lift up our voices in worship to you, God, that we would bow before your throne and give you the honor and glory that you deserve, God. So, Lord, we just give this time to you. God, we give this whole morning to you. May your Holy Spirit just come in this place and just have control over every aspect this morning. And Jesus, we just ask all this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, you can remain seated or you can stand. During our time of worship, the main thing, of course, is the attitude of our heart that we would uh, desire to worship in spirit and in truth. And uh, this first song just really gets us off on the right foot. Speaking of love, it's because of God's love for us. And that's the reason that we're here, because he loves us so. <laughs> Yeah, 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 As we come into your presence, we remember every blessing that you poured out so freely from above. With your gratitude and praise. For compassion so amazing Lord, we come to give you thanks For all you've done Because of your love We're forgiven Because of your love Our hearts are clean We lift you up Songs of freedom forever we're changed because of your love. 
because of your love. That you poured out so freely from us. In gratitude and praise, for compassion so amazing. Lord, we come to give you thanks for all you've done. Because of your love, we're forgiven. Because of your love. Because of your love, we're forgiven. Because of your love, our hearts are clean. We lift you up with songs of freedom forever we'll change because of your love we're forgiven thank you Lord because of your love our hearts are clean we lift you up with songs of freedom Forever we change because of your love. Because of your love, Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because of your love, God, you are the faithful one that loves us more than we could ever comprehend. And we stand in awe of you, Lord. God, and we just lift up our voices, giving thanks to our God and our King. Thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing, praise, sing, praise. The mighty hand, the mighty hand, and an outstretched arm. Love endures forever Before the life that's been reborn His love endures forever You're faithful, and we just praise you from the rising to the setting sun. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. And by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. See.
Lord, you alone are faithful, so we give you thanks. Let's sing that first verse again, church. Give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing your praise. Sing it, church. Lift up your voice. And I sing Reflecting again on the ultimate expression of that love is laying down of your life for ours, the shedding of your blood for our sins. Lord, we can never comprehend in our limited humanity, God, the reality of what really occurred and the depths of your unto for us and because of your love. Lord, we just know that in your very name is the name speaks of salvation, Yeshua. The Lord is salvation. That's what it means. So we thank you, God, that you are mighty to save, that you give us eternal life. All we can do is praise your name. Thank you, Lord. We just continue with an attitude of worship and gratitude. Mm -hmm. Give my 
perfect sacrifice and as your word says and as the historic evidence proves three days later you rose from the grave and you're alive forevermore for all those who put their faith and their trust in you and have eternal life Lord and that's why you gave your life for us so that we could spend eternity with you Lord Jesus we can never thank you enough the ultimate gift you would love us so that you would provide that so we just continue in an attitude of worship this morning just in your presence thanking you for your love for your faithfulness God continue to draw our hearts to yours and father we thank you that we have this privilege as we continue with this worshipful attitude to enter into a time of prayer and Lord, your word tells us that's such a wonderful privilege and responsibility. But Lord, we know when we pray according to your will and according to your leading, that you do wonderful and awesome things that brings glory to you. So as Bob comes and leads our time of prayer, just give him sensitivity to your leading that he would pray according to your will. Nothing more, nothing less, Lord. That's all that matters is your will. Father, we just join our hearts this continued time of worship and adoration in Jesus' name. 
you know, be seated for a prayer time, just continue in the attitude of worship. Good morning. As uh, anybody who has a TV or a, a radio or a computer or newspaper has probably figured out right now, we're in the middle of an election season where we've got an army of uh, candidates running around telling us that uh, uh, we need to vote for them for one reason or another. They're going to give us this or do that for us. And, and uh, one, way other way, one way or another, if we vote for them, everything's going to be great. But I'm here with a reality check. I'm going to read, start by reading Romans 13, verses 1. And we'll see what, about, what the Lord has to say about this. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except what God and the, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. In other words, God gives us the leadership that we deserve. If we are a nation that prays, that uh, follows him, he'll bless us with good leadership. And if we're a, t a nation that le turns a blind eye and follows our own paths, he's going to not so bless us with poor leadership. So I see what's going on in the world today, and I say this is a nation that des doesn't deserve blessing. We deserve judgment. Well, I'm going to follow that up with what, we're the, what we should be looking for. Instead of looking to candidates to make our lives loader, better, you know, a couple, last couple of weeks, uh, my base message, my messages have revolved around keeping our eyes focused on the real source of our blessings. Keeping, in other words, keeping your eyes on the prize, what really counts in this world. And I'm going to read a, uh, a chapter here from Psalm 23, which should be extremely familiar to most of you. The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I, fear no, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You appoint, anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And the best verse of all, the last one, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The idea here is keep our eyes focused on something that really matters, our Lord. And let him be your candidate. Let him be your guide. And Whatever we're faced with in this world, Lord will, see, Lord will see us through, and we have a destiny with him that two seconds after you leave this world, that's all that's ever going to matter. Everything that went on down here is going to mean almost nothing. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord. We have a God that loves us. He loves us so much that not only did he send his son to die for us, he wants us to know him. He's given us everything we need, Lord, to have a, a close relationship with him, Lord. We, we, uh, you've given us the, your word so we can know you. We can know what our destiny is, Lord. Uh, you've given us guidance to guide our lives so that uh, we can live a happy and fulfilled life, Lord. Lord, we just are so awed by your, your love and your caring for us, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this place of worship. Lord, we thank you that uh, you've given us a, a town where we can worship and, and uh, in safety and in peace. Lord, they know that's not so true for so many of our brethren around the world. Lord, we raise these people up to you, Lord. Believers all over the world that are being harassed, persecuted, murdered, you name it, Lord, uh, chased from their homes. Uh, we raise these people up to you, Lord, and ask that you'll bless them and, and comfort them and protect them, Lord. In the same frame, Lord, we want to pray for Israel. Israel, this tiny little nation. And uh, we know their destiny, Lord. We know that you have determined that they are the, in the, back in the land forever. 
and it, uh, no one's going to chase them out, Lord. We ask that you'll be with them, protect them, raise up leadership for, for them, Lord, that know the Messiah. And Lord, we just, uh, we'd like to pray for our military, uh, our firefighters, our policemen, those that are, are uh, that are uh, put over us to govern us and to protect us, Lord. We ask that you'll be with them, Lord, and uh, take care of them, Lord. Lord, we ask you'll be with the teachers in this church as they teach the kids and, and ask that you bless them. And we thank you so grateful for all the people in this church that have risen up to, to help serve. Lord, we ask you'll be with Phil today as he teaches you the word of God, Lord. Inspire him, be with him, make it clear. And Lord, Amen. with all this, Lord, we ask that each and every person here would walk out of this church today better equipped to be a witness for you in this devil's world than they are they were yesterday lord be with us as we go through our week and give us opportunities to be your witness lord to be better witnesses for you to spread the word to be bold and and give us the words lord when we have our opportunities to share the love of jesus with others around us lord we thank you for all this in jesus name amen Thank you, Elder Bob. <laughs> Good stuff, my friend. Touch it up. Ah, oh, praise the Lord. God is good. And it's been a, it's been a wonderful morning, our 9 o'clock service. Just uh, God's presence here. And just as we continue in an attitude of worship, an opportunity just to get in God's Word, just sense His, His presence with us this morning. And God's Word is true that if we uh, humble ourselves... If we'll seek Him, we'll draw near to Him, He will draw near to us. And I and, uh, just sense that this morning. And I'm glad you guys are here to be a part of, of this particular service as we continue in our study of God's Word. But before we get into the Word this morning, and by the way, we're going to get back on track with our study in the book of Daniel. Absolutely awesome study. So just a couple of things to bring you up to speed on uh, some developments and where we're at. Uh, by the way, these are sitting here. I better point the attention to this huh, before I forget it. How can you miss this, right? <laughs> uh, some wonderful... People in our fellowship have been overseeing a project for, what, about the last month? Is that right, Michaela? Uh, so we've got Michaela and Jamie and a whole host, a whole team of people that have put together these Valentine bouquets. Now, ladies, <laughs> that's the kind of bouquet you want, right? I don't know. That's, I like that. It looks good. <laughs> but they've been doing these. <laughs> okay, my wife warns me that that doesn't mean it's mine just because it's right here. But uh, these guys did this, uh, the, the, the fundraising event went very well. Of course, it's for the Guatemala missions trip that's in July. We have uh, 40 people that are going to be going to Guatemala in July. And there wound up being, I think, eight or nine that were left over. Some orders that were placed, people didn't pick up. And so uh, if you guys would like one, please see Kayla, Michaela after. We, oh, we're down to six. Oh, that's cool. So see Michaela, raise your hand, would you? And uh, she'll get you hooked up with those after the service is over. And just know that, again, they're only $15 a piece, but the funds go to the Guatemala missions trip, which is a very worthy I endeavor. And uh, it's going to change lives. If people have ever gone on a missions trip, you know the impact it has on you personally when you go and you serve the Lord. And then, of course, you have the opportunity to serve other people. The impact you can have on them, too. So it's a win-win deal. So that's the deal there. I'm going to set that back here. I better lay it down so it doesn't fall down, right? Also, uh, women's ministries tomorrow because it is a holiday and kids are out of school. There will not be any women's study tomorrow at 11 or 6 o'clock. You guys will be back underway on that next Monday. We are on track Wednesdays. We've got two more weeks in this prophecy series we've been doing on Wednesday nights. And then the first Wednesday in March, we'll begin our James study. Really excited to get into that. We've got the study guides in. And uh, we'll put up a sign-up sheet out in the foyer next week to uh, gauge the interest on that so we make sure we've got enough study guides We've been averaging about 20 to 30 people and adults on Wednesday night, so it's been great for a midweek study, and uh, it's going to be awesome. What an awesome book James is. Practical Christian living, authentic Christian living is the heart and the focus of that. Also, in terms of opportunities to have an impact in our community, because you'll hear it here. If you're part of our fellowship, you've ever visited or you're here, you hear us talking about being the hands and the feet and the heart of Jesus, making an impact in the world. Not just being here to be fed, but once we're equipped, and we're in God's word to be willing to go outside of these four walls and to be used of the Lord to have an impact in people's hearts and lives. 
And so when there are opportunities that come up, not only for us individually, we encourage you to take those opportunities that the Lord directs, but then we also have corporate opportunities. And uh, March the 6th, we've secured the event center, the new convention center. If you've been in there before, you know it's, a, it's an absolutely wonderful state-of-the-art facility that's been provided for our community. But we'll be doing the live simulcast of Harvest America, Pastor Greg Glory, who is a Calvary pastor out in California. Most of you are familiar with Pastor Greg, Greg Glory. And uh, he's been doing crusades for years, just sharing the gospel. And there have been thousands and thousands of people who responded and accepted Christ because it gives a very clear, concise, biblical proclamation of the gospel, the need for Jesus, and thousands of people have responded. So we're going to be partnering with that. It'll be live broadcast from Dallas uh, the, for the Cowboys play. I know there's some Cowboys fans here this morning. And, you know, actually, you should be fans <laughs> right here. Super Bowl <laughs> champions, baby. <laughs> so we'll be praying for you guys. <laughs> but that stadium's going to be packed, probably about 80,000 people there. And then all around the country, there are going to be uh, solid Christian churches hosting events, people doing it in their homes as well, uh, just inviting people to come where uh, there will be some wonderful music. Mercy Me, a lot of you are familiar with Mercy Me. They're absolutely wonderful. Switchfoot, uh, actually part the Switchfoot guys, they come out of Calvary Chapels as well. And then also uh, Lecrae, Garrett's shaking his head. Lecrae is going to be a part of that as well. And then Chris Tomlin will lead worship before Greg shares the gospel. So it's all live. And the, the, the equipment at the convention center, state of the art, it's amazing. Crystal clear presentations on the projection. It's going to be the next best thing to being there. So uh, we've got a little video thing I want you guys to play, if you can, just kind of give you an idea of what's going on with this to kind of set it up for that. And we've got several weeks to prepare for this, and we'll have some more information for you next week as well. Every year, people of all ages are passing into eternity at an alarming rate. People we know, people we love, that message is the proclamation of the gospel, pointing to Jesus, that it's all about him and his love for us, the sacrifice that he made on the cross. And we all know people who don't know him. We all know people who, if they were to pass now, they don't have eternal life. And so the first thing we should do is we should pray. And we can pray. We need to be praying for loved ones. Ask the Lord to put it on your heart, people to pray for. Then also invite people who come and hear the gospel and then bring. Pray, invite, and bring. And uh, again, we're, we're trusting the Lord is to move in the hearts of a lot of people and uh, excited to see what he's going to do with that as the word is given and the proclamation of the gospel is declared. So it's only a few weeks out. Man, the spring is coming quickly. Are, are you guys liking the longer days, the warmer temperatures? Bring it on, huh? <laughs> we're looking forward to it. So again, be praying about this and what God's will would be in all of this. And one last thing before we dismiss our middle school and junior high class and fourth and fifth graders is uh, we're going to have a bit of an update on the building project next week. It's going to be small, concise. But uh, we have gotten into a phase where we're a little bit behind, a little behind schedule, and it's with our architectural and engineering phases, a couple things that had to be revisited. We had actually anticipated that by now we'd probably be uh, in the framing phase, and the Lord has provided the funds for that. So we're just we're in a holding pattern. And so it looks like the way things are trending, that it's going to be late March, 
because everything, you've got to dot all your T's, cross your T's when you've got engineers, architects, and all the approval that has to go on because there's permitting for every phase. And this is permitting for the interior. The exterior has been uh, closed out and approved. It's done. And so now we're moving into that, but things have just gotten behind schedule with, again, our architectural and engineering aspect of it. And that's out of our hands. So just be praying. Timing is in God's hands. And we're excited because the Lord has provided everything for the framing phase. And also, He's provided for the next phase. So I'm going to share a little bit about that next week. That in spite of the economy and the challenges that are being experienced in this area, the Lord is faithful. He is Yahweh Yura. The Lord is our provider. And uh, we don't do fundraisers. We don't do anything to manipulate or pressure anybody. We always teach about the tabernacle and God's faithfulness to stir hearts. And he's been faithful to do that. So we're excited about what he's doing. But the most important thing, it's all about Jesus. That's just a place, right? It's just a place. Just like this is just a place. The most important thing is that we're here to seek him and to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. So with that, let's dismiss our middle school and junior high and fourth and fifth grade classes. You guys can head on out. Appreciate our teachers who are investing in them. And, of course, even while they're going out, remember that there are kids in our nursery next door and our preschool classes right now and our CKC, and that's first through third graders. They're already over there right now just learning and growing. Continue to pray for our children. Pray for those who invest in our kids and serve them so faithfully. And as Bob said, we have a wonderful group of people who made themselves available to serve. And we've got over 50 people who are part of our leadership teams who serve and teach in these various ministries and serve at some capacity. So I am very thankful that the Lord has raised up these wonderful, godly people who, uh, who serve, serve us and serve Him most importantly. So with that, open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3. We're in Daniel, this amazing book in the Old Testament. We've spent a couple of months here and we've really torn it apart. That's why it's taken a while to get through chapters 1 and chapter 2, but there's so much depth there. And so we wanted to make sure that we were doing a comprehensive breakdown and a study of God's Word. And then we had a, a couple of weeks off, and I do appreciate Bob Barton, one of our elders, who uh, did a two-part series over a, a few weeks when uh, I was out of the loop with my family for our daughter's uh, drill team competition. This is our last rodeo. Our daughter Paige is a senior, and our daughter Erin's a sophomore, but this looks like it's our, our last go-around after four years. So we appreciate you guys giving us the opportunity to spend that time together as family. And Bob has been so uh, diligent in preparing and teaching on the Abrahamic covenant the last two times he taught. So I bet you guys were blessed by that. And it's just an important thing as well. So now, with that in the rearview mirror, we're in Daniel again in chapter 3. And as we always do, I like to read through the text first. Give you an understanding, the big picture of the verses we're going to be breaking down and opening up. So we'll do that now. Then we'll come back and we'll look at left, date, le uh, length and the depth. I was, just, I was trying to combine those two words. It doesn't work very well. <laughs> so here we go. Daniel chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue that he had set up. So all these officials came and they stood before the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald shouted out, People of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshipped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But some of the astrologers or Chaldeans went to the king and informed him on the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, Long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, the flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments. That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in to Nebuchadnezzar, he said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue that I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, as we undertake this study and this time in your word, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would guide and direct us. Lord Jesus, you said the Holy Spirit was the teacher who would lead us into all truth. So we ask you would guide and direct us, Lord, that you would give us sensitivity to your leading, and again, you would be the real teacher. God, we thank you for your word. It's living and active. It's powerful. And we pray that as we study these historical realities that occurred 2,500 years ago, we know that your word is living and there is a practical application for us. So, Lord, just speak to our hearts. May we be enriched and equipped through our time in your word. And again, may you be glorified in our lives and in this study. And we pray these things, Father, in Jesus' matchless and holy name. Amen. So we go back to the beginning of this chapter. And if you recall, the last time we were here and we closed out Daniel chapter 2, we saw that reality of Nebuchadnezzar having a dream. And he saw this image in this dream, and it freaked him out. He didn't know what was going on. So what did he do? He went to his astrologers. He went to those who were part of his occultic team of counselors and asked if they could come, but not only to interpret the dream, but they had to give him the dream. They had to tell him what the dream was. So the pressure was on. Of course, nobody could do that. None of his counselors, none of those who made up that unique group of people who were his advisors and counselors, and by the way, again, their source of information was from the enemy. It was occultic. They had no place to go. There was nothing they had to offer. So Daniel is brought to the forefront, remember? And because God is with him, and that's what he told Nebuchadnezzar, that there's not a man who could tell you, but there is a God in heaven, and he's the one who can tell you. So Daniel is the instrument, not only told Nebuchadnezzar what the dream was, but he interpreted it for him. And so with that in mind, we jump into verse 1 of chapter 3. Now King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall, and nine feet wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So in the theater of your mind, try to uh, take that in. That, that's tall, folks. That's tall. <laughs> you know, you drive by, I talked about the building project. When you drive by the building, the worship center, if you'll notice that, where it peaks and pitches at the, at the center, that's 45 feet tall. So this image is at least twice that tall. 90 feet tall. So it was an attention getter. You could not miss it. It was sitting there, and that's what Nebuchadnezzar had designed and desired, that everybody would not miss what he had set up there. And he had a reason for that. Now, it's interesting that the statue was made completely of gold. Now, if you recall, going back to Daniel chapter 2, when Daniel did give the interpretation of the, the image that Nebuchadnezzar had seen in his dream, it was made up of a gold head, and Daniel had told him that God was showing him that he was the head of gold and so was the Babylonian Empire. Then there was an inferior kingdom that would come after that, the, the Medes and the Persians made up of silver. Then there was a third kingdom that was represented by the, the bronze and then, of course, the legs of iron, the Roman Empire. And then ultimately the feet made up of a combination of clay and of iron. So what does he do? He sets up a statue, but it's not made up of four different elements. It's made up of gold, period. Now, why would he do that? Do you think he had in mind something relating to the dream that he had or the interpretation that, that Daniel gave? I think there's a connection. But this isn't something that happened a week later or a month later, chapter 3, on the heels of chapter 2. This is probably about 10 years at least since what we saw happening here, 8 to 10 years. Some scholars believe it might have been a little bit longer than that. And one of the reasons this happened is we know historically in the Chronicles of the Babylonians, that there was a coup attempt against Nebuchadnezzar. Of course, he put it down. And this guy was a cruel and a vicious dictator, and he had people killed all kinds of uh, uh, dastardly ways. I mean, these guys are evil and they're mean, and they did wicked things. If you remember when we were talking in Daniel 2 about all those counselors that came to Nebuchadnezzar and they didn't have the answer for him, he was going to have them all killed, remember? And he was going to actually have Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and 
and Abednego killed as well. But because they had the answer, they were spared. And they asked that the king would spare all the other ones. But how he was going to have them killed, and this was part of what they did, one of the ways, and it's kind of gruesome, but they would take trees, and they would pull four trees together and tie the tops together. I mean, they were strong trees, so they would have plenty of torque when they released, but they would tie the people onto them with a limb on each one of those trees. And then they would cut it loose, and, well, you can imagine. Not a pretty imagining, right? But that's the kind of stuff this guy did. And, and to think that somebody would try to overthrow him, you know, that's pretty scary that they would even want to do that. But it was put down. And so what he does is he sets up this statue to tell everyone in his kingdom that he is the king. And they will pledge their loyalty to him. And one of the ways they're going to do that is that they're going to bow before the statue and they're going to worship this image. By the way, there's definitely some uh, prophetic elements of that, eschatological aspects of that too. And I'm going to save that till next week. There's typology here relating to the last days. Stuff that's yet to be fulfilled that's going to happen in the time of the end. And we know it's rapidly approaching. So I'm going to save that till next week when we close out Daniel chapter 3. So we set the stage for what's happening here. And when it says in verse 2 that then he sent his messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue that he had set up. It speaks of eight different groups of people who served in his kingdom. It's a lot like the cabinet under president or people who had government rules uh, or positions. And when some of your translations say satraps, as the first group there are high officials, high officers, they were given the responsibility of making sure that the realm was protected, that the king was not overthrown. So he calls the highest guys all the way down to the lowest guys who are part of the provincial rule. And by the way, historically we know there were over 100 provinces in Babylon at that time. So scholars believe there were in the neighborhood of probably 250, 300,000 people gathered on the plains of Dura that were all part of serving Nebuchadnezzar and ruling in his kingdom. That's a lot of people, folks. I don't know if you've ever been in a group of people that big. Some of us have been in football stadiums with 75, 80,000 people. That's a lot of people. But I've never been in a group of people where there were 300,000 people. That would be a lot of people. So it's against this backdrop that we find the situation and this image, the statue has been erected. So we find in verse 3, So all of these officials came and stood before the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. You think any of them dared not to come? <laughs> no, they knew who Nebuchadnezzar was. They knew that his rule was absolute. They knew that the consequences of not coming would be catastrophic. So we find again, as they purpose to come in verse 4 then, that once they arrived on scene, and you have this towering image, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people gathered on the plain of Dura, that it says in verse 4, that then a herald shouted out, people of all races, nations, and languages, listen to the king's commands. So uh, your attention, please. What you're about to hear is very, very important. And regardless of what your ethnicity is, your background is, what you, your language you speak, wherever you come from, give an ear because your life depends upon it. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Verse 6, anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a, a blazing furnace. So no pressure, right? <laughs> uh, you do this or you, you, you bow or burn. You've heard that terminology before, right? Have you ever heard that? Bow or burn. It's amazing the different catchphrases and sayings that people have had in cultures down through the years. So much of that stuff comes from the Bible. We'll see later on where uh, the writing is on the wall. That comes from an episode later on in, in the book of Daniel as well. And people still use those phrases even today. But this is where this comes from. If you did not bow to worship this statue, this image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, then this is what would result. You would be thrown into this blamey, blazing furnace. So here they are. They're gathered. This, this furnace is there. It's operational. It's up and running, anticipating that if somebody doesn't obey, then they're going to suffer the consequences. So what do we find? In verse 7 it says, So at the sound of the musical instruments... All the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshipped the gold statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. 
So in the theater of your mind again, you can imagine all of these people getting on their faces before this statue. And this immense, what I envision, immense symphony, or worship team, if you will, playing, and they're responding to that. By the way, you know, worship is, is a crucial thing. All cultures and societies, most people love music, right? The reality is God gave us music, and the reason he gave music, by and large, is for worship, to worship him, the one true living God. But you know what the enemy does and humanity does? They take and they pervert. And you don't have to look very far <laughs> to see a lot of perverted stuff dealing with music and even the use of it in false religions and false worship systems. And that's exactly what was going on here. The worship of false gods plus the worship of this image. So against that backdrop, with all these things happening, and all these people bowing, we find this in verse 8. But some of the astrologers, some of your translations may say Chaldeans, unique class of advisors of people who served Nebuchadnezzar. They went to the king and informed on the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, Long live the king. And that was a customary greeting from that culture and that time period. And by the way, if you wanted to have favor in the king's eyes, you know, that's probably a good thing to say, right? Live forever, king. (laughs) That's a good thing. Because otherwise, if you didn't, he might take you out. So they said, Long live the king. But they reminded him of the decree in verse 10. You issued a decree requiring that all the people, that they would bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments. They reminded him of the second aspect of that decree. That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. It's a pretty dramatic setting. Again, hundreds of thousands of people. Do you think those guys might have stood out? (laughs) Everybody else has bowed down, and these three Jewish guys are standing there not doing it. You know, if if you want to see a really awesome in-depth treatment of this, you need to check out Veggie Tales, Rack Shack, and Benny. That's that's classic. That's good stuff. That's deep theology. (laughs) But that's really good stuff. So here they are, and you know what? These guys, the, the astrologers, a lot of these guys who made up the servant class of Nebuchadnezzar, those counselors, these astrologers, the Chaldeans, they were mostly, by and large, people who were uh, Babylonian. And most of these guys hated Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they seized an opportunity to come against these guys. And they were going to utilize this opportunity. There was some jealousy there. I'm sure they were familiar with what happened. And you would think that if any of these guys were part of the situation 10 years previously... When Daniel, and it says also that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were there as part of that and were also put in positions of authority, that they would be thankful because if it wasn't for Daniel stepping up, they would all have been dead. But no, they hated these guys and they wanted to take them out. And so with the decree that Nebuchadnezzar had given and his purpose with it was to make sure that his people who were serving him, people who were part of his government and the people who were part of his nation were loyal to him, and that they would worship him, they'd worship the false gods that were part of the kingdom. And he was wanting to make sure that they were going to do just that, be loyal. So when all these people bow, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they did not. And these title tales <laughs> went to the king and informed. And what did they say again? That latter, verse 12, let's read that one more time. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon, making sure that he knows exactly who these guys are, they pay no attention to you. So the contempt is there. They're, they're actually building this up. They pay no attention to you, king. And I think they were trying to make that a broader thing, more than just that particular circumstance and issue with the image that had been set up. But they're he's trying to up undermine these guys all the way around. They pay no attention to your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and don't worship the gold statue you have set up. So there we go. He's informed about the situation. What is the response in verse 13? Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage. This guy was volatile. When he flew into a rage, and the word says he flew into a rage, that wasn't a pretty picture. Heads were going to roll. In this case, bodies were going to burn, right? 
He flew into a rage and he ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. And when they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, so look at this. We've got an audience here. These Jewish men, they're close to 30 years old by now. We know when they were taken captive with Daniel, they were 14 years old, 15 in that time range. They were in the University of Babylon, we call it, for three years. Then there was the, uh, the reality of Daniel giving the interpretation of the dream. But then it's been t- eight to ten years later since then, so here they are at that stage. And they've been faithful to the Lord their God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the whole time. Even though they'd been serving, they were not giving in to worshiping false gods. So when they're brought in, verse 14 says, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue that I have set up? Pretty intense situation, I'll bet. And there were a lot of onlookers. I wonder if this might have been more of a public setting, considering that the statue was set up and the call to worship and to bow down was something done in a large public setting to make sure that everybody saw that the attention had been drawn from that now to this issue. So there was a lot on the line. These guys had a lot of people looking on. So as he asked them, have you done this? Have you refused to worship my gods or to bow down to this gold statue? It says in verse 15 that he then says, I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue that I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you'll be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then, and this is key, and then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? So he thinks he's a, he's a top dog, right? Well, he knows in terms of his kingdom that what he says is absolute and people will respond. But he challenges the one true living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When he says, if you refuse, and then what God will you be able to, will be able to rescue you from my power? Well, he was about to find out, right? Now, as we read this, as we picture in the theater of our mind this setting and what's happening here and these three Jewish men standing before him, God was with them because they had chosen by faith to be faithful to the Lord. And God honored that. And we find in verse 16, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. Now they were direct. I'm sure they weren't arrogant. They were bold, which is they had confidence, but why? Because the Lord their God was with them. But when they said, we have no need to defend ourselves before you because he said, hey, you know, we're not going to try to make any excuses. Now you add, or you've ordered this and we're not doing it. It is what it is, <laughs> O king. That's what's going on here. It is what it is. Verse 17 says, and I love their response. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us, period. Is that the truth? Absolutely. And we have chronicles throughout God's Word, throughout the historical account of God's Word, the times when God does supernaturally step in and save His people. But folks, we have chronicles in God's Word too. And there are stories throughout history of believers who suffered great tragedies and difficulties and trials and persecution. It's not because God couldn't protect them. In His sovereignty, things are father-filtered and sometimes people go through some challenging and difficult things. And they knew that God could preserve and protect and save them. And they were fully confident in that. And he says, He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. So that's kind of an in-your-face, right? He will regi- regi- uh, save us, rescue us from your power. It's a direct address to the king. So he's been challenged. Uh, I can just see him sitting there on his throne. <laughs> he's probably not loving that either, right? He understands what they're saying. But look at verse 18, guys, and this is so amazing. Because we didn't read these verses before. I saved them. But if he doesn't, speaking of the one true living God, if he doesn't rescue us, right? We want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. They were committed wholeheartedly to the one true living God that they loved and they served and empowered them. 
That had to be the Spirit of the living God with them right there. And you know what? When we see the latter part of this chapter next week, we are going to see this is one of those amazing times where God intervenes and He does step in and He glorifies Himself in this situation. And these guys have made that proclamation. But here's the reality. Practical application is that God can preserve and protect any of His people. And He's been able to do that throughout the ages. He's the one who spoke and said, let there be. And the entire universe came into existence. He can certainly preserve and protect His people. But again, there are times where He doesn't. And people wonder, where are you, God? What's going on? I don't understand what's happening here. And we find ourselves not in a fiery furnace, but in the refiner's fire, where God uses these challenging and difficult circumstances and situations to make us more dependent upon Him. And also He uses it to burn away, like a silversmith, the dross and those things, till there's a pure product sitting there that's been conformed into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's why God allows challenging things sometimes. So we like that verse that says, hey, we serve a God who's able to save us. We're like, yeah. But then we read verse 18, but if he doesn't, we're like, what? <laughs> so Lord, there's a possibility that in my circumstance and the difficulty that I go through, you may not deliver me from that. Maybe not. But if you trust him, he will see you through it. No matter how difficult or how challenging it may be. He is faithful and God is glorified. And you know what? That's when a world sees. Because it's easy to hang on to God when everything is wonderful and all the good stuff's happening, but it's when there's faith expressed and invested and trusted into God when things aren't going so good. That's real faith. That's genuine faith. God, I trust you no matter what my circumstances are. And I will seek you. So in this particular situation and scenario, these guys are being faithful to the Lord their God. They would not worship an idol. They would not pledge allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar in his request to worship this idol. And when I see this, what about contemporary situations that we find in our world today? You know what? You and I, again, something we've addressed many times, and there's, there's reason for it. We live in, in freedom. We are so blessed to live in America, and yet our freedoms are being eroded. Make no mistake, if you're not paying attention, our religious freedoms are being eroded. And if you're not watching, one day you may wake up and find yourself in a situation where you've got people saying, uh, do it this way or else. Every day, as we've talked about before, in third world countries, whether it's believers in the Middle East at the hands of ISIS, or believers in North Korea or China or Iran who make a stand for Jesus, they lay down their lives for the cause of Christ and for Jesus. And God could deliver them through that. And there are miraculous stories of some that he does for his purposes, but there are those who draw their last breath. When there are Islamic terrorists who say, convert and accept and bow to Allah or you die. There are children, children, seven, eight years old, who say, we love Jesus and we will not. And they die for Jesus. That's hard for us to comprehend, folks. That's just, that's demonic. That any human being could do what these people do to others. And we, that's been throughout history, what Nebuchadnezzar would do, what Hitler did. Regardless of the background of the people, their heritage, their ethnicity, that's what human beings are capable of doing when they don't know the Lord and the enemy is using them and manipulating them. We pray for Muslims. We pray for all people who don't know Jesus. And my prayer is that when those scenarios come up, when there are believers who are being told, you either worship our God or you die, that in that testimony, because that's martyrdom, that's a real testimony, when they lay down their lives for the cause of Christ, my prayer is, and I believe that's the prayer of those people and their families who know Jesus, is that that has a huge impact on the lives of those people. And they go, I can't believe that that kid or this person was not willing at my threat to give in. And my prayer is that we will see the other side of heaven. We'll see when we're in God's presence how cool would it be and will it be to potentially meet terrorists who came to faith in Jesus as Messiah because of the witness they saw in the people they were killing. 
And we think that's so barbaric. How could that happen? There's a man who God used to write half the New Testament that was the killing Christians. His name was Saul. He thought he was doing God a favor. It's no different. Until Jesus opened his eyes in Acts chapter 9, he had an encounter with the one true living God, and he realized Jesus was Messiah, that he had been raised from the dead, and God used him. You talk about a 180, a new creation in Christ, and God used him in an amazing way, right? That's what God does. He transforms. He gives new life. So in the midst of our challenges, folks, how would we potentially respond? Go with me to Acts chapter 4. I want to go to uh, a new covenant example of believers with Jesus having come who are facing persecution at the hands of officials who say, do this or else. And there's certainly some similarities with what we find with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and them coming before Nebuchadnezzar. And so to set the stage before we jump into Acts 4, what we find here is a historical account of Peter and John. In chapter 3, they've come to the temple in the afternoon for a time of prayer. Customarily, that was what the deal was. And for years and years and years, there'd been a lame man at the gate going into the temple who couldn't walk. And it was 30 plus years this guy was in this state. And he depended on the kindness and the generosity of those who were going in and out to provide for him. But God had a divine appointment that day for Peter and for John and for this man. As they're entering in, the Word of God tells us that Peter caught his eyes and they engaged each other. And that this crippled man, probably assuming that if he engages them, that maybe they'll give him some, something to help him in his needs, some alms, as it's called for the poor. So when he looks at Peter, Peter says, silver and gold, I, I don't have any of that. But what I do have, I give you. Rise and walk in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Can you imagine that, folks? Hundreds, probably thousands of people in the temple area. Peter reaches down, grabs him, and as he rises and as they express faith, the Lord meets this man in his crippled state and brings strength to his muscles and to his bones. And he's standing, and before you know it, he's dancing and praising the Lord. And he's been crippled for 30-some years. Do you think that's an attention getter? And everybody who had been used to coming in and out of the temple, they knew this man's state. They knew that was a miracle. And what it did was it provided an attention getter. And as the people are drawing around, wondering what's going on, Peter then sees the opportunity, led by the Holy Spirit, to proclaim the gospel and to share that this man was raised and he was healed because of Jesus, by the power of Jesus, right? So he shared the gospel, and more people came to faith in Jesus. At Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 got saved. And we're going to see here as we jump into Acts chapter 4, this is the response on the heels of Peter sharing and God moving. In verse 1 of Acts chapter 4, and by the way, the narrative is so clear. And right, by the way, God's word is what matters, right? Not what a man has to say, what God has to say. So I just love reading these verses. It speaks for itself. In verse 1, it says, While Peter and John were speaking to the, temple, at the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. So who do we have here? The high council, the Sanhedrin. By the way, Paul's probably part of this group. Saul, we'd call him <laughs> at that point. He becomes obviously much more involved later on. But it's unique to think that he was a witness to these things. These were the guys, many of them, who were responsible for Jesus' crucifixion. That's who confronted them. Peter and John knew who they were. Verse 2 said, These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. Sadducees really hated that because they didn't believe in a resurrection. <laughs> Pharisees did, but not Sadducees. So that's why it says they were torqued. Verse 3 says, They arrested them, Peter and John, and since it was already evening, they put in them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it. So a number of the believers now totaled 5,000 men, and that did not include or count women and children. So man, the Lord is moving. The Holy Spirit is moving. People's eyes are being opened to Jesus being the Messiah, that He's been raised from the dead. They're coming to faith in Christ. Verse 5 says, The next day the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. They had a quandary. Annas, the high priest, was there along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. Those names, Annas and Caiaphas, should be familiar, right? When Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane, and He was brought before who? 
Annas the high priest and Caiaphas. These guys were part of the kangaroo courts. Those three, uh, by, by the way, according to Jewish law even, illegal things that they had before for Jesus' trials. It was in that setting that they beat him and that they ripped his beard out of his face. Isaiah gives us some insight to that. So by the time he left there and they'd been spitting on him and punched him and they tore the beard out of his face, he was already a sight. But then he would go on to be scourged and to be beaten even worse till the point when he would take up his cross to begin to make his way to Golgotha. As Isaiah prophesied, he would be so badly beaten that you wouldn't even recognize he was a human being. That's how bad it was. But he did that all for us. These guys were part of that scene that night. Peter and John again knew that. So it says in verse 7, they brought in the two disciples, Peter and John, and they demanded, by what power and whose name have you done this? So, you know, we're thinking back to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, hey guys, they're being called on the carpet. What are you doing? And that's exactly what's going on here. What if you're ever called on the carpet? What if just in your workplace, somebody says, in a very antagonistic way, I hear you're one of those Jesus-loving Bible thumpers. You know, I, I, those terminologies just crack me up, by the way. <laughs> I don't know about you, I never thump my Bible. <laughs> I read it a lot, I study it a lot. But yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, just, uh, it's just people, you know, being antagonistic. And they get in your face. Say, are you one of those, do you love Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? Is that, is that you one of those guys, girls, youths? How would you respond? Because right now in America, that's probably as bad as it would get. Unless you're in a junior college in Oregon where a man walks in a room and says, anybody here a Christian? And the first one said, yes, I am, and he shoots them. And he goes down the line and continues to ask people and the ones who said, yes, I believe in Jesus, and he shot them. That happened last fall in Oregon in that junior college, folks. That's in the United States of America that people were asked to make a choice for Jesus, and they did. Wow. They had no clue the minute before he came in that room that that could ever happen to them. And I'm not saying it's going to, but they can never imagine that. I believe that God meets his people right where they're at, just like he was doing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just like with Peter and John. He meets his people when we say, Lord, I'm going to stand for you, humbly, thoughtfully, but confidently, because I trust you, God meets us and he empowers us by his Holy Spirit to stand up to that moment in time for his glory, right? And we have this wonderful reality right before us. Again, as the Sanhedrin, they bring Peter and John and they ask, by what power and in whose name have you done this? Look at verse 8. Then Peter, what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Guys, we need the Holy Spirit to empower us. The point we're saved the Holy Spirit takes up residence in us. We're born again by the Spirit of the living God. Paul would say that, do you not know that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? So he indwells us. He comes inside of us. But the Word of God also tells us he's poured out upon us. It's empowerment to live for him. We see times where it said, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul said, be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's not this aberrant, weird, charismatic stuff where people are going off and going, you know, swinging from chandeliers. It's being empowered by the Spirit of the living God just to live our lives. And to be in the moment when these situations happen like this because we're living for Him. I pray every day that we pray, God, I need to be filled with your Holy Spirit today because I can't live this life in and of myself. Can you guys? I can't. That you empower us by your grace and you fill us with your Holy Spirit. And when it says, verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember, this is the Peter that just probably two months before that had denied Jesus three times. Went after he was arrested at Gethsemane. The same Jesus, or Peter that even engaged Jesus across the courtyard as he was going through those trials and being brought out. It says that Jesus caught his eyes and they looked and Peter began to weep convulsively because he knew he had denied him. Same guy, right, who just said before, oh, they're not taking you out, Jesus. Uh, you know, if, if they try to, I'm, I'll, I'll give my life protecting you. So here's this Peter, but now Jesus has restored him and the key here again as here's a man who just preached at Pentecost, the gospel, Acts chapter 2, 3,000 were saved. Chapter 3, again, God provides an opportunity for this miraculous healing. He preaches the gospel, more people are saved. It's not Peter, it's not John, it's not Shadrach or Meshach or Abednego, it's not you or me, it's God. 
and it's God meeting his people where they're at. Isn't that amazing? And he was meeting them here. So when it says Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, he said to them, rulers and elders of our people. So he begins to address their Jewishness, by the way, because Jesus was a Jewish Messiah. Are, you being, are we being questioned today because we have done a good deed for a crippled man? Certainly that wouldn't be the case, right? That's a good thing. Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that when he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Wow. Can you imagine being part of that scene? <laughs> Witnessing that? Peter was confident and bold. He wasn't arrogant. But the Holy Spirit was using him, speaking to him. And he just put it there like it really was. And he said, he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus, Yeshua. Christ is the Greek. Hebrew would be Messiah, Yeshua, Mashiach, the Nazarene. So it defined clearly who they were talking about. This Jesus, the Nazarene. And boy, he puts it in their face. The man you crucified. Wow. And they were the religious leaders who had gone to Pilate and had set this up, wanted to have Jesus crucified. So there's a direct application, but we see in God's Word too that we're all, folks, all of us, because there are a lot of people throughout church history who have tried to kill the Jewish people because they rejected Jesus as Messiah by and large, and they called Jesus, or the Jews, the Jesus killers. Uh, our sin killed Jesus. doesn't matter where you come from or who you are, Jesus died because of all of us. And the enemies played that card. And even people like Hitler played a religious card and played that angle. It's been done throughout history where people try to kill the Jewish people and they play a religious card on that. But what he's saying here again is just their part that we're culpable for. But they said, he, they said look, this is the man who was raised from the dead. Verse 11, for Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures. So he says, God's word says, and he goes back to the Old Testament scriptures, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And these religious leaders would have understood what he was saying. They didn't like it, but they would have understood it. Verse 12, there is no salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Receive salvation. The name Jesus, again, that's the Greek, or the English of Jesus, that's the Greek, and then the Hebrew is Yeshua. It's Joshua, Yeshua. Yehoshua means the Lord is salvation. When he says there is no other name given under heaven and earth by which a person can have eternal life, it's Jesus Christ. When he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, it's exactly what he meant. There's no other way, no other religion. It's not about religion, by the way. It's relationship, right? Thousands of religions in the world. It's about having a relationship with Jesus. So when he says that, look at the response. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. They could see... Now look at this. They could see they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They hadn't had the rabbinical training like those guys had, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes. They'd gone through all that. They knew they were fishermen. They were ordinary guys. But here's the key. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Wow. Aha. <laughs> they had been with Jesus. Do people know when you've been with Jesus? Do people know when I've been with Jesus? I hope so. I hope that we spend enough time with the Lord that people see Him and His love and His light shining through us. Jesus said He was the light of the world, but He also said in Matthew 5, we're to be salt and light, right? And that's exactly what's being stated here. They knew, they could see the power and the presence of God in their lives. They had seen physically, they had recognized that Jesus had been, they'd been with Jesus, but the most important aspect of that was aha moment for everyone else that's why they are the men they are because they had been with jesus how awesome is that now we continue but since they could see that the man who had been healed standing right there among them there was nothing the council could say so they ordered peter and john out of the council chamber and they conferred among themselves what should we do with these men they asked each other we can't deny that they have performed a miraculous sign and everybody in jerusalem knows about it now remember they gave Jesus the credit for the miracle, right? These guys are attributing to these guys. They're saying, no, it was Jesus that did this. It was by his mighty name this happened. 
And they say, we can't deny the sign has happened, by the way. The word sign, say mino, means a pointing to. That's what signs do. And in fact, you sometimes you see signs that have an arrow on them, right? And they say, go this way. That's what it means. It was a sign pointing to Jesus, the Messiah. And yet, they were blind and couldn't see it. But they couldn't refute the reality of the healed man. So what do we find then? Verse 17. After he said that everybody knows in Jerusalem what has happened here because of this miracle, verse 17 says, but to keep them from spreading their propaganda, that's how they viewed it, any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. And they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. So it's kind of like, okay, you got it, we're giving you a break here. Kind of like Nebuchadnezzar with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You guys, I'm going to give you another chance. <laughs> Just do what we tell you to do. And these guys are saying, don't speak ever again in the name of Jesus or teach in his name. And look at verse 19. But Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything that we have seen and heard. They couldn't deny it. They couldn't stop. And here's the reality. As Bob gave that devotional this morning about what it says in, in the Bible about authority and leadership, God sets up people in positions of authority. A lot of times in cultures when it's bad authority, like he said, it's because that culture deserves it because they don't see God, they don't serve God. We've seen in our country these realities. And we pray for our, those who are in authority at the national level, the state and the local levels. We always pray for them. That God would love them and that he would open their eyes if they don't know him, that they would want to follow the word of God as they administrate and do what they do, and that God would bless our communities and bless our country. So we always pray about those things. And we live in a country that now we still have the freedom to speak the name of Jesus. These guys were under the threat that that could not happen. Again, what would happen if that ever becomes part of our experience? Whoever it is that would say, don't be speaking about Jesus ever again, or there will be consequences. And God says we're supposed to obey the authorities as long as what they're doing in their administration of authority is consistent with His Word. But when they directly command people to do stuff that's outside of what God has commanded us to do, we see the response that these guys gave. Do you think God wants to obey you rather than Him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. Same thing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They couldn't deny their God, and they wouldn't. Folks, we need the world to see Jesus in us. No matter where we go, if we know the Lord, people need to say, you know what? I think they've been with Jesus. <laughs> Perhaps they would say, I know they've been with Jesus. I see His love. I see the fruit of the Spirit in that person's life. I see a person being conformed to the image of Jesus. And again, when God does entrust trials into our lives, just like these guys are experiencing. By the way, they go on to continue to share and, and they thank the Lord that they've been given the privilege to suffer for the cause of Christ because in the very next chapter, they get called in and this time they get beaten. And they're threatened again. Don't do that. Quit talking about Jesus. And this time they were beaten. And then we see that throughout Peter's or John, or Paul's ministry when he came to faith in Jesus, how many times he was persecuted and beaten for the cause of Christ. And he never gave up. And that's, that's a God thing. You know, in our humanity, we don't have the courage or strength to do those things. But when we've got a heart that says, Lord, I, I love you, and I want to follow you wholeheartedly, he meets us and he empowers us. He fills us with his spirit, and by his grace, he empowers us to live for him. And folks, as we conclude our time in the Word today, we're going to transition into a, into a time of communion. Because today being a, a day where people are thinking about love, <laughs> Valentine's Day, right? Again, no greater love was ever demonstrated than the love that God showed us when Jesus himself died on the cross for our sins. And he was hanging on that cross. And in that connection that we have with him now, the, we're going to have some guys who are going to disperse the elements for you guys. And the worship team's going to come up. So you guys go ahead. You can get the light. That'd be great. So when you get the elements, and up in the coffee house, up in the upper room there, there's elements up there for all you guys up there. You get the elements here, go ahead and hold on to them. We'll take them together, but we're going to do a song before we do that. And this is an amazing song. It's a, it's a powerful song. It's a powerful song.
about Jesus' love and his sacrifice. It talks about that, and I hope it really speaks to your heart and you can sing it wholeheartedly. So while you're waiting for the elements, why don't you just close your eyes and use this opportunity just to connect with the Lord. Just let him speak to your heart. forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again let's see that church I'm forgiven I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. And I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love. Amazing love. You, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, and I know it's true. And it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. Let's worship with all of our hearts. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. The Spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love. King with 
just the way the song says. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken, God. I'm accepted because you were condemned. You were the substitute in my place. And I'm alive and well, and your spirit, God, is within me, all because you died, your sacrifice, and you rose again. And we are amazed, as it says, amazing love. How, how can it be? Lord, that you are king. Would stoop so low to humble yourself to become one of us and to offer your life as the ultimate expression of love on the cross for us, for our sins, for the sins of all mankind. We stand amazed and we're in awe of you, Lord, and your love. And as we come to this time of taking the elements and participating in communion, Lord, spend a moment to reflect we think about you on the cross and the state that you are in all because of your love for us and before you were nailed to the cross it was just hours before that that you were with your disciples gathered in that upper room, celebrating the Passover, Lord. As the Jewish people had done for centuries, Lord, that reflection, commemoration of your faithfulness to set them free as captives. Prefer, pre preserve their firstborn because of the blood of the lamb over the doorposts of their homes. And there you were, the lamb of God about to give your life, about to shed your blood for our sins, Lord. And as you celebrated that Passover with your disciples, they couldn't have imagined the depths of what was about to happen, though you had told them time and again that you must give your life. We thank you that you came on the ultimate rescue mission. You fulfilled your plans and your purposes for your glory and for our benefit, Lord. And so as you were gathered with the disciples, you took the bread as part of the Passover, and you blessed it. And according to the Jewish tradition, you would have said, Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam ha'mersi lechonen ha'aretz. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives us the bread from the earth. Lord Jesus, you broke it. You gave it to your disciples and said, this was representative of your body that would be given for them and for us. You said to take and to eat, and to do this in remembrance of you. And today, Jesus, out of obedience and adoration and love, we commemorate your sacrifice, and we too take and we eat. Jesus, then you took the cup as part of the Passover Seder and you blessed it. You would have said, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam, Arei Priyagafen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives us the fruit of the vine. And you told the disciples that this represented your blood, which was about to be poured out on the cross for the remission of all sin. 
and we stand in awe of what you did and that indeed your blood was shed for us. And as you told them about that reality that it would be your blood that would cleanse us from all sin and unrighteousness, Lord. We have the gift of looking back to the cross, having your completed word and being able to reflect with a unique perspective, Lord, that just fills our hearts with thankfulness and gratitude for you and what you've done. And so as you ask the disciples that night to take and to drink and to do it in remembrance of you, this morning likewise again, out of obedience and love and adoration, we also take and we drink and we do this, Jesus, in your name. Father, thank you so much for this time that we've shared together today, Lord. Just thank you for this place of worship. <clears throat> we just thank you that you, you show up in our lives in a mighty way. All we really have to do is just ask you, invite you into our lives and into our hearts. We come. Thank you for showing up today, Lord. <laughs> Thank you that you, you give us grace and you give us mercy every day despite the fact that <laughs> we're still sinners. We still fail you every day. Your grace abounds. It covers all blemishes, Lord. Through your sacrifice, you make us righteous. Not because we deserve it, because you love us. Help us just to call upon your name. There is no other name, heaven or on earth, by which we can be saved. Way the truth and the life. Thank you for that, God. Help us just to commit this final worship song to you. Just pour out our hearts, lift up our voices to you, God. Just to give you true worship and adoration. Just to honor you, to pay homage to you, and to to use our voices and to to sing out. And to use the beautiful gift of music for what it was created for, which is just to give you praise. Just be with us now as we sing this final worship song.
Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. All our hope is in you, Lord. All our hope is in you. God, our Savior, and our King. And thank you for our time today, Lord. Just continue to uh, draw us to you. Throughout the remainder of this day and every day, Lord, give us a heart for you and your word. Just make us more like you, Jesus, through the working of your spirit and your word. In Jesus' name. You guys have an awesome uh, rest of the day together as family and friends. And just want to say this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you as he shines upon you. Let him shine in and through and out of you so that wherever you go, people will see Jesus, the light of the world. God bless you guys. Have a great day.